Hello, this is Carrie Bible tour guide at Hollywood Forever Cemetery, and this is, I think, like week 20 of my Hollywood Forever tour talk. So I know I'm wearing the peacock dress yet again, but I gave a tour today and then I had to run some errands. So this dress is more or less my official tour dress in my Saturday uniform. So I, I still have it on right now. Um, we're going to start off the episode here with uh, a little talk about the latest on Close Up and Leela the Doppelganger. A lot of stuff happened today. Oh my gosh. I I don't even know where to start. Um, it's so funny. Okay, so I was giving the tour today and Close Up, of course, was following along with the tour. And then when we got to DeMille, Leela joined us. And DeMille's area is really Close Up's turf. And so... Leela's joining kind of became a problem. And I love Leela too. I, I want to spread the love. I don't want to just ignore one cat and only love close up. I, I feel like I have enough love to go around here. So I'm trying to feed close up and Leela and pep them and do the tour and do my stuff. And then, so we get to Adrian and Janet Gaynor, and then we get to Virginia Rappe, who, by the way, that's who we're going to talk about today. Anyway, that's where we had the problem because close up, he gets on top of Virginia Rappe's headstone or marker, and he lays there. He frequently does this. And as I'm petting him and talking about Virginia, I can feel close-ups back kind of tense up and arch a little bit. And I'm like, oh, boy, he's getting, he's getting real agitated here. So then Leela walks up to close-up, and then Leela stands there, and they're kind of giving each other the evil eye. It was like Cuban Missile Crisis level tension, right? And then close-up just pounces at Leela. But the amazing thing was Leela stood her ground. She stood there and just stared close up down and she didn't bat an eye. She didn't budge an inch. And one guy on my tour said, wow, that cat did not flinch for one second. Leela is a gangster. And I just started laughing so hard. That just cracked me up like crazy. And then they sort of chased each other off and kind of left the tour at that point. After the tour, I got a cup of coffee and I joined um, some people at the cemetery who have a loved one there. And we were sitting at the grave and being the tremendous dork that I am, <laughs> I couldn't help it. I got this um, Halloween haunted castle scratcher for cats and we assembled it or actually the gentleman and the assembled it that was there at the cemetery. And we we set it on one of the uh we set it on a nearby area and close up was i guess he was really tired at this point because he had a busy day in addition to fighting with leela over dominance he chased a squirrel through the cemetery he chased a butterfly i think close up he's kind of wore himself out so he sat near us just sleeping and then leela i lured um we lured me and the family i was with here we lured uh, Leela with catnip and with treats, and she climbed around the castle and played in it. And I'll post pictures of this afterwards as if anybody needed proof that I'm a total nerd. I'm like playing with the cat in the cat castle at the cemetery. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, close up was not real happy. And then I had a bag of a, a plastic container rather of Temptations treats. And I sat them nearby and I forgot to put the lid on. And of course, Leela took full advantage and just literally plunged her head all the way down into the, the container. And so it's, it was a busy day at the cemetery dealing with the, the cats. But Leela is so sweet and she's really, she's really starting to assert herself, which is really sweet and really fun to see. And she's got so much personality. And the other thing about Leela that is so funny is just she's not putting up with close-ups dominance. She is calling him on it. And it's like she called his bluff today. Like he pounced and she just wasn't having it. And, you know, I, again, I don't want to play favorites. I love animals so much and I, I want to spread the love. And Leela wants what we all want, everybody wants in the world, I assume, including me, which is treats, love, and attention. So I can't blame Leela for seeing the attention treats and love that close up gets and wanting in on the action. So I'm trying very hard to make both cats happy, give them as much time and food and love as I can. It's a bit of a juggling act. I'm trying the best I can. We'll see what happens. The, the adventure will continue. So that's the update on the cats. 
Now onto the star we're gonna talk about today is Virginia Rappé. I'm gonna be really honest here. I've actually been avoiding talking about her for quite some time, and the reason is this. She's one of the more controversial figures, I guess, at the cemetery on the tour. And any time I post about her or I talk about her, a lot of the time it is accompanied by a lot of misogyny. People saying cruel things about her, untruthful things about her, or just plain totally incorrect stuff and getting in arguments or even fights. And frankly, I don't know about you guys, but the pandemic's been really hard. And it's been hard on my energy levels. And a lot of the time I feel like I'm doing pretty well to get out of bed and be able to carry on with my life as, in as much as I can. So I haven't had the bandwidth, if you will, to moderate people arguing or fighting or insulting each other or saying crap on my Facebook page or YouTube page or whatever. I'm really hoping that doesn't happen after my little broadcast tonight. But my friend Donna Hill in San Francisco, she's a historian that I greatly admire, and she's kind of really encouraged me to go ahead and, and talk about Virginia. So I finally decided this week that I was ready to do it, and this would, this would be the week. So um, this week, <coughs> excuse me, I need some water. So it's very smoky out here for those of you who don't live in California. It's been very, very rough on us, the air quality, especially northern, actually. But, mm. okay. Um, this past week, September 9th, marked the 99-year anniversary of Virginia's passing. And so I wanted to talk about her, to talk about this case, to kind of do a more in-depth analysis, at least to me, of it a little bit. And that's one of the reasons I chose to do this at six tonight, because had I pre-recorded it, I probably would have done 50 million takes, not been happy with any of them and never gotten it done at all. So that's why I'm doing it at this time of day. Okay, so first off, we're gonna talk a little about Arbuckle, just a little bit. Arbuckle was literally and figuratively one of the biggest comedians around. He just made, in 1921, he just made three films in a row at Paramount Pictures and he wanted a vacation. And so it's Labor Day weekend of 1921. So Arbuckle and several of his friends drove up to San Francisco and they got a series of suites in the St. Francis Hotel, which by the way is still there and hopefully will survive this pandemic and remain there. And they got a series of suites and they're having a party. They're drinking. It is prohibition, so yeah, liquor was illegal in America at that time. Not that a lot of people took that seriously, but it was. Um, apparently, according to another historian I'm friends with, they also had cocaine at the party. They were partying and having a good time, and Virginia Rappé was invited to this party, and we're going to talk about her in a minute. At this party, um, Virginia and Arbuckle were in a room alone for a brief period of time. Arbuckle runs out calling for help. Virginia, meanwhile, is writhing in pain on the bed, screaming, ripping off her clothes. Everybody at this party is very drunk, so their judgment is not good. They start trying to do some college tricks to sober Virginia up, and those weren't working. And they finally decided that they needed to do something else. So they called a hotel manager at the St. Francis. They got her a separate room. They called a doctor. And they did what probably most of us would have done in that situation. Just assume, okay, she's just super drunk. It's a little out of control. She'll sleep it off down the hall. She'll be fine in a day or two. That's okay. You know, party goes on. Little did they know this was a lot more serious than anybody had imagined. And Virginia would die several days after this party of peritonitis and a ruptured bladder. Virginia's friend, Maud Delmont, who was at this party, and by the way, also very drunk at this party, accused Roscoe Arbuckle of raping and murdering Virginia. Arbuckle was arrested and charged with murder. It would eventually be reduced down to manslaughter, and he would be put through not one, not two, but a total of three trials before being completely acquitted of all wrongdoing. The first two trials ended in a hung jury, and the third trial, he was finally acquitted. The jury only spent a few moments deliberating before declaring him not guilty. But the damage was already done. Arbuckle was fired by Paramount Pictures. 
his films were yanked from distribution and he was basically more or less blacklisted from an industry that he helped to build. He directed shorts and B-movies under an assumed name. He tried owning a nightclub at one point. He tried working in vaudeville. He tried a lot of things to sort of regain everything that he had lost. But sadly, time would not be on his side. And he struggled for about a decade or so. Ten years later, Jack Warner of Warner Brothers decided to give Arbuckle a second chance. So he hired Arbuckle to do a series of short films, and they were talkies by that time. Arbuckle made these, and these films were well received. And Jack Warner decided he wanted to get Arbuckle making his first feature film as a star in over a decade. But sadly, that would never come to fruition as Arbuckle died in his sleep of a massive heart attack. He was only 46 years old. He was cremated and his ashes were scattered at sea. And this is tragic for Arbuckle, who I do not believe committed rape or murder. But the real tragedy that always gets lost in any high profile criminal case, and I follow a lot of them because that's an interesting thing to me, is the story of the victim. We see in our society, in case after case after case, oftentimes victims are treated as if it was all their fault, as if their life didn't matter, as if, especially in a high profile celebrity case, if they were not famous, they were not wealthy, they were not celebrated like the person who was accused of killing them, then they're treated like they are so much lesser than, and again, as if they didn't matter. That is not true, and they do matter, absolutely. And I get very angry at the blame the victim strategy, and that's exactly what happened in this case. Virginia Rapay had a very tragic life beset by hardship from the beginning. She never knew the identity of her father. Her mother died extremely young. She was left to be raised by her grandmother, who then died. So Virginia has nobody and is alone in this world at a very, very early age. She was very beautiful, so she became a professional model. She designed hats, she designed clothing, she was a world traveler. She was named by one newspaper as the best dressed woman in Hollywood. And she even gave an interview to a newspaper about ways women could create jobs and opportunities for themselves. So I would argue Virginia is a free-spirited, independent young woman, perhaps ahead of her time. But at the third trial in particular, Arbuckle's defense team went on the attack. And they said every terrible thing you could ever say about a woman about Virginia. That she was a drunk, a tramp, a whore, a, um, that she had abortions, that she had venereal disease. I mean, the list went on and on and on. And other than the drinking, which, let's face it, a lot of people did, there's no proof of any of those further allegations. Again, it is a blame the victim strategy on someone who is not alive to defend themselves. And also, in our society, there's a tremendous double standard that still exists today, I believe, and it's existed for probably since the beginning of time, is that if a man you know, is wild or likes to drink or have a good time or date a lot or whatever. They're a stud, they're admired, they're, you know, applauded for this. But if women do it, they're slandered and they're treated very badly. And again, it's extremely unfair and it's, it's, it's wrong. And also we have to take into account here that nothing happens in a vacuum. Anytime something happens in history, even things in the world right now, they're the result of not one thing, but an amalgamation of things. And for example, when this Arbuckle case was going on, first off, the year before this case, you had prohibition becoming law of the land. There were a lot of social reformers and women and just people across America that thought alcohol was poison, that it was illegal, that it was tearing apart families, that it was immoral and needed to be banned. And they got what they wanted for the time being, from about 1920 till about 1933, prohibition was law and alcohol was illegal. So you had prohibition. 
Then you had women exercising their independence and getting the right to vote in 1920 and really make, trying to make their voice heard. Now, this is only white women. This is not women of color, and that is completely wrong. Unfortunately, that would take longer to happen. And then, so you have, you have the right to vote for women. You have prohibition. And also, there was a tremendous conservative backlash against Hollywood. And there were a lot of people who felt that Hollywood was Sodom and Gomorrah by the sea, that a lot of movie stars were sort of sinful creatures that were influencing their children in terrible ways. And I mean, I, I kind of think it's silly. I mean, when I see Arbuckle throw a pie at Buster Keaton, I, I really fail to see how that's going to corrupt the morals of an American youth. But believe it or not, there were people out there who did feel that way. They felt Hollywood was evil sinful theaters needed to be you know abolished they, they really there was a lot of conservative tide that was against hollywood so when you factor those qualities in all of these things and then you have this scandal what it creates is in essence a perfect storm and as i had mentioned at the third trial they really attacked virginia and also as I've encountered sometimes with the tour, and this is a frustration of mine, is sometimes people believe what they want to believe in spite of the facts that are right in front of them. Like you can present them with all the evidence in the world and they still want to believe a certain narrative even if there's no truth to it. And one day this lady on the tour said, you know, after hearing your story, that's not what Kenneth Inger said in Hollywood Babylon. And I said, well, what he said on Hollywood Babylon was completely untrue and incorrect. And she said, yeah, but that story was a lot more fun. And I said, well, how would you feel if Virginia Rappay was your mom, your grandmother, your aunt, your, you know, relative somewhere? Would you feel that way about it? And she said, oh, I guess that's different. I said, well, yeah, it is. And, you know, the, the truth is that Virginia was a flesh and blood human being. Virginia walked the earth as, as we do now. And I think that one of the jobs, as I see it, that I have on the tour is to really sort of give these people humanity and dignity and kindness and get as close to the truth of their lives and who they were and what their lives meant as I possibly can. And during the trials, especially the third one, Virginia's one-time boyfriend, silent film comedy director Henry Lerman, he defended Virginia's character in the press. He paid for her burial at the cemetery, then known as Hollywood Memorial Park, and he asked to be next to her 25 years later when he died in 1946. And to this day, people still leave. Uh, someone has been leaving for quite some time now, a pair of shoes and a purse on Virginia's grave. And I assume that is a tribute to Virginia's fashion sense and her passion for fashion and design. And again, this was a case where, you know that game telephone, which a lot of us played as little kids, like maybe I would tell Tracy something. And then it would go through Stacy and Stetson and Barbara. And then by the time it got to William, it was a completely different word or a completely different story. I think that is a lot of what happened in this case. I think there was a tremendous climate of fear, of paranoia. People were worried about the film industry even being shut down at that time again, because there was such a tremendous backlash. And people were afraid for their studios, for their careers, for their livelihood. And also, I think, too, that um, the media played into this because William Randolph Hearst sold a ton of newspapers doing daily coverage about this case. And someone once said to him, they said, how could you do this to Arbuckle? I mean, you've ruined his life with a lot of the coverage you've done. And Hearst apparently shrugged and said, she's business. So I think that for a lot of people, the hype the hysteria surrounding this case sort of enveloped them. And I think the truth is hard to know, perhaps not impossible to know, but very hard to know. And I've talked to several people. Um, I had two ladies take my tour a while back. They were professional trauma nurses in an ER unit. 
and I'm pretty fascinated by medicine just as interest. So I asked them about this case and we talked about it and they said they see, obviously they see some pretty grisly and horrible things in their job. And they said, you know, since Virginia, the punctured bladder was, you know, part of her cause of death. They said that um, general assault would not accomplish this. And there were rumors that he had violated Virginia with a Coke bottle or a champagne bottle. Had he done that, she would have likely bled out and died that day. She didn't. She died several days later. They felt that they told me that even the only time they ever see bladders burst like that is in this case of a severe blunt object in a car accident or something that extraordinary. And there's also another film historian that I know named Tracy Gossel. She is a film preservationist. She's the official biographer of Douglas Fairbanks. She's also a doctor. I asked her about this case as well, and she felt that um, it was the result of a glass catheter. She said that was the kind of catheter they used at the time, and she felt ultimately that was what punctured Virginia's bladder and brought about her death. But I don't think Arbuckle committed rape or murder. It's tragic. I think it's just a very, very tragic confluence of events. And there's been a lot of books written about this case. Most of them are pretty questionable at best. And a lot of them, they try to make it very one-sided. Either one party is the absolute saint and did nothing wrong at all, and the other party is this evil, horrible person. And the truth is more complicated. It is nuanced. I think we live in a society that wants easy answers. They want things to be neat and tidy, black and white, and life is a lot more gray and complicated than most people, at least it seems, want to acknowledge. And these were complicated people. This is a murky situation. There's only one book that I can recommend about this case, and it is Room 1219. It does not have the punctured glass catheter theory, but it does purport that she obviously had some sort of blunt force that or fall that caused their bladder to burst. But this is by Greg Merritt. It's I'll post the cover too on my page when this is over. But this is an outstanding book and it's incredibly well researched. It's well done. And also it is fair to Arbuckle. It is fair to Virginia. I felt this book really went to pains to be fair to both of these parties and present them as the complicated, interesting people that they truly were. And I highly recommend this book. And again, I think that um, in the 99 years since her death, Virginia has been treated so poorly. And I think, again, that's something that upsets me is when I see these cases and I see these victims be treated like they didn't count, and they of course do. So I recommend this book, and I recommend just, when you see stuff about this case, just think for yourselves and read up on it, read up on the facts, think in depth about the details, and you know, again, I think even to this day, there's still lies that persist and myths that persist, and I think that it really doesn't serve anybody by putting this out there. I think it is best to always try, again, to uncover the truth when and where that is possible. So I recommend this book. If any of you want to comment or have questions, that's, that's okay. That's great. But please, 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 no misogynist comments, nothing sexist or angry or fighting, because to be honest, we live in a hard, hard world with a lot of division, a lot of difficulty, and I just don't want to have to go there and moderate this kind of stuff. And just again, Virginia's life mattered too. People loved her. She had friends. She had an ex-boyfriend that still loved her. And even Henry Lerman, again, paid for her burial, was buried next to her, and for the rest of his life carried her photo in his wallet. So, um, Virginia, mattered and that's that's really what I have to say about that so I hope that you will read room 1219 if you are so inclined 
and thank you for joining me for yet another episode of Tour Talk. And thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.